Good morning, and a warm welcome to New Covenant. My name is Chris Costaldo. I serve as lead pastor. We're delighted you're here. I want to thank the elders and other leaders who urged me to take off for a couple of weeks following the busyness of Holy Week. It's been a wonderful time of recharging. There are certain books that I like to go back to uh, at, on such occasions. Eugene Peterson's writings, uh, Kent Hughes' Liberating Ministry from the Success Syndrome. And so, uh, hearty thanks again for your support during these weeks. Just a couple of announcements. Moms Morning, we want to give a break to moms this coming Saturday uh, from 7 o'clock a.m. Is that right? No, sorry, that's May 7th. Pardon me. 9 o'clock is when it begins until 11. If you haven't had a chance to sign up to help watch the children or to participate in some other way, you can still do so. You'll find those sign-ups available in the narthex this morning. Also, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Table this morning. Uh, like last month, we have the elements that are available on the table in the rear of the sanctuary, and the elders will also be distributing the elements from pew to pew. And so uh, if you prefer to, uh, to have the packets, then by all means, please uh, help yourself. And now let us call ourselves to worship with the words of Isaiah the prophet, he writes in chapter 61 and verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Good morning. Please stand as we sing our hymn of adoration, Sing Praise to the Lord. Thank you.
Please remain standing and join me, along with our fellow believers across the world and throughout the ages, as we, with hearts of deep conviction and gratitude, joyfully affirm our common faith through the words of the Apostle, Apostle's Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I'm so grateful to have Dr. Dan Block opening God's Word for us today, preaching one of my very favorite passages in all of the Bible, Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. Before the pastoral prayer, I want to mention this was a special week. I received an email, one that I have been receiving every year for the last 15 years. Some of you know the name Carol and Tom Klobuchar, Christian leaders in our area. Um, for all these years, Carol has sent me uh, an email on this date reminding me of a sermon I preached on Ephesians 3. They uh, it was at College Church Sunday morning, and I exhorted the congregation to pray as though God heard our prayers and had the power to answer them. Well, Tom and Carol went home and they learned about a very good friend who had just given birth to a child prematurely. And so they decided to go for a walk, Tom and Carol, and apply what they had just heard this young preacher talk about in the morning. And as they walked, they prayed fervently. They called out to God. It didn't look as though this child would make it. His name is Austin, but he did. Uh, God heard their prayers and the prayers of others. Austin's life was preserved, and that was a turning point for the Klobuchers. They said God did something uh, in us during that walk, impressed upon us the, the vital necessity of heartfelt prayer. And so all these years, I get... Uh, a lovely email of encouragement, thanking me for my sermon, always with a picture of Austin. So I've seen him grow up, you know, it's marvelous. It's, it's truly one of the joys of my ministry. Well, I mention that for this reason. Number one, we who preach do so with the realization there's nothing we can say in our own strength to change lives. But God condescends to use the foolishness of our preaching in order to bring about transformation. Praise God, praise God. And then secondly, prayer is powerful. Sometimes we pray and we wonder, is God listening? Yes, he is listening. And so it's in light of that truth, I invite you to join me now as we pray. Dear God, there are so many reasons why you are singularly worthy of being loved, and praised, and served. But as we begin this morning, we want to rehearse some of them out loud. For any number of pseudo-gods clamor for our heart's attention today. Therefore, please help us to love you with full devotion, unfettered abandon, and unwavering allegiance. Lord Jesus, according to your word, you expressly came into the realm of time zones and molecules to deal with our sin. The price was your life of perfect obedience, including your obedience to death on the cross. Please never let us think or speak of your sacrifice presumptuously. Instead, may we invest every ounce of energy, all of our thought, labor, and concentration for your glory. We confess this past week we've often chosen selfish ideals over you. 
We've set our hearts on illusory hopes and half-baked promises instead of submitting to your good will. Therefore, we take these moments now and silently confess our sins to you. Of this we are certain. Jesus, you have exhausted the penalty of our sin. Though we are still destined to die, we have been delivered from judgment because of your once and for all sacrifice. Dominion of darkness, all that is evil, has been conquered fully and finally at the cross. And we look forward to the day when everything in creation will be submitted to your glorious reign. You are Lord, and the reign of your grace is supreme. And when you appear a second time, you will indeed deliver us, and not just us, but the entire universe. We pray on behalf of those who are in the crucible needing grace this day. We pray for Gracie Canfield, and for Bob Ohms, and Mary Tooney. Please, Lord, heal and empower them. We also pray for Karen Sawyer, and Al White, as they continue to recuperate, would you uphold and strengthen them with your merciful hand? Finally, Lord Jesus, we confess there is no other Savior like you, the King who advances his reign of love throughout the earth. In light of this reign, we pray together now the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. We want to thank you for your continued generous and sacrificial giving to New Covenant. It is by your giving that the ministries here in this church, in this city, and the support of our missionaries across the world can happen. So we thank you again. We remind you that there are two ways in which you can give. The first is through newcovenantnaperville.org, and the second is through the offering box at the back of the sanctuary. Children of all ages are welcome to stay and continue to worship with us throughout the entire service. In addition to that, we do offer our Wonders of Worship program downstairs in the Education Wing for children ages four through second grade. If you are a visitor here, we encourage you to seek out our information table at the back of the narthex where you will find more information about our values, our beliefs, and about us as New Covenant. Of course, you can also seek out any of us as elders or the ushers, and we can help you in that process as well. If, um, let's see, please look in the center of the aisle. You will find the uh, registration pad where you can note your attendance here. That is a very useful tool for us as elders to see where there may be some needs within the body that we can pray for and, and um, talk through. And now, let us turn to our New Testament reading. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 14 through 27. Then Jesus told them, the disciples, plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is God's word.
Today's scripture reading is Ezekiel 37, one to one, uh, verse 1 to 14. <clears throat> this passage can be found on page 724 in your pew Bible. After the reading, please remain standing for the singing of the doxology. Now, if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is indeed a great joy to greet you all in the name of the Lord. And what a delight to be with you, to fellowship with you this morning, and to minister together with my good friend, Chris Castaldo. We pray the Lord's continued rich blessing on you and your family and this congregation. May the Lord bless you richly in his service. Popular interest in the subject of this chapter is evident not only from television broadcasts like the Jack Van Impey program, but especially in the face of the phenomenal success of the Less Left Behind series of fictional writings. 
to date, more than 80 million copies of these left-behind books have been sold, leading the book review editors at time to comment that these are, quote, the best-selling fiction books of our time, right up there with Tom Clancy and Stephen King, end of quote. But evidence of our culture's fascination with things eschatological, especially relating to death. Evidence is everywhere. It's in the lyrics of our rock groups and in their names, some of us remember, the Grateful Dead. It's in the graffiti in the railway overpasses, in our schools, on our highways, it's in our cancer wards, it's everywhere. Well, actually, it always has been. What makes our age different from any other is that even while more and more Americans are forced to deal with violent and premature death, whether murder or suicide or drunken drivers or COVID or gun violence in our schools, increasingly, we laugh it off as if it's a joke, maybe a cruel one for some, but for others, it's another one of life's absurdities. And when you see what's happening in Europe these days, it really does seem absurd in the Ukraine. Well, ever since our ancestors left the Garden of Eden, we have actually been preoccupied with death as the saying goes, you know, in this fallen world, there are only two things that are certain, death and taxes. And we've been wondering about the former. The text of our meditation this morning deals with this subject of death and afterlife. In fact, it's one of the most uh, fascinating texts in all of scriptures on this subject. One day while Ezekiel was exiled in Babylon, suddenly he felt the hand of God seize him again. And I'm sure he wondered, what's it this time? But in visionary form, he was transported by the Spirit of God far away into a valley full of bones, human bones, white bones, dry bones, very dry bones. As far as the eye could see, nothing but bones. But what did these bones mean? Well, to answer the question, we could go right to the end of the passage, verses 11 to 14, which actually is what triggered the vision. What you have in verses 11 to 14 is what we in the academy call uh, disputation speech that you can tell a disputation speech because they begin with a quotation often in Ezekiel you hear him the Lord say son of man have you heard what the people are saying now tell them so the what the people are saying is the fundamental thesis that needs to be debunked and replaced and here the thesis is, have you heard? He, he doesn't actually say, have you heard what the people are saying? But notice he said, they are saying our bones are dried up, our hope has vanished, we are doomed. Therefore prophesy to them. So that this prophecy is actually the answer to the hopelessness in the face of death. But let's focus on the first 10 verses as we try. I mean, when you read this passage, you're faced with this vision of dry bones first before he tells us why we're doing this. So let's look at this. Imagine how Ezekiel's audience would have reacted to what he was describing and then let's explore how they might have tried to figure out the significance of what's happening. What clues do these words and these images provide about the point he's trying to make? 
Well, first, the last sentence in verse 1 says the whole valley was full of bones. And then in verse 2, he reiterates with, and look, they were exceedingly many. Well, the significance of that will not become apparent until verse 10, but for the moment we can simply conclude that this must have been some catastrophe of immeasurable proportion, something horrible, a valley full of bones. Second, the bones lay on the surface of the ground. You can see them. They are the remains of bodies that have been left out in the open, exposed for scavenging buzzards and jackals to be devoured. And all that's left is the bones. Third, the bones are very, very dry. This means that they've been there a long time. They are the remains of some bodies, creatures, that have been dead long, uh, that died long ago. Fourth, they are the victims of some great slaughter. Oh, verse 9, we finally get it. They are the slain which tells us they did not die natural deaths. These are victims of slaughter. But whose bones are they? He doesn't tell us. Until verse 9, Ezekiel has us scratching our heads. For all we know, they could have been the bones of cattle or sheep at some grand sacrificial site. Or wild animals hunted down for their meat as it used to happen in the prairies of Canada with the buffalo. Or they could even have been horses slaughtered in battle. For those of you who have watched The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings movies, even that possibility becomes reasonable in our mind. But in verse 10, the prophet gives us a more concrete clue. When the breath enters these bodies, they come to life and they stood on their feet, resulting in a fantastic scene of a massive army of men filling the valley. So they are human bones. What we see here is a picture of death in all its horror, intensity, and finality. Whoever, they rep whoever these bones represent, they've been dead a long time. And this is no Arlington National Cemetery or Flanders Fields where poppies blow beneath, between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the lark still bringing, bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with a foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. This is no Flanders fields where the heroes are buried with due uh, magnificence and gravitas. No, this is no Edenic cemetery. This scene is ho as hopeless and depressing as it can be. But whose bones are they and why were they not buried? It would have been most natural for e Ezekiel and his audience on that point to think of the slaughter of his own people on that fateful day in 586 when Nebuchadnezzar's forces had stormed the city of Jerusalem, razed it to the ground, and slaughtered the 
inhabitants. But why were they not buried? Were there no survivors to take care of them? And then what's the significance of the vision? Well, actually, if you know the world out of which this text comes and where Ezekiel in Babylon was living, throughout the ancient Near East, leaving dead bodies out in the open to be devoured by animals was the worst kind of curse anybody could experience. One of the curses in Ezar Haddon's succession treaty, Ezar Haddon's your favorite hero from ancient times, from Assyria, he wrote, May Ninurta, foremost of the gods, fell you with ferocious arrows. May he fill the steppe with your blood. May he feed your flesh to the eagle and the vultures. That's the curse if you don't, aren't loyal to Ezar Haddon. But this reminds us of Moses' own warning for the Israelites in the previous millennium. And those who once remained of this grand, great kingdom in exile with Ezekiel, they should have thought about this. Here's what Moses has writ had written in Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you will become an object of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your carcasses will become food for all the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth. And there will be no one to frighten them away. So that's what's happened. These bones represent the remains of a people who are under some horrible curse. These are the bones of those who have been conquered because the Lord has brought in his agents to do the work of judgment for centuries of rebellion against him. That's who they are. But let's be more specific. Who are they really? And whom do they represent? We may answer that question at three levels. First and most obviously, these are the bones of the armies of and the population of Judah defeated and destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar in 586. We don't know exactly when Ezekiel had this vision. He may have been contemplating that horrible event when, when the Lord brought him to this valley. But it must have been at least 10 years after 586. Israel is very, very dead. Israel is under the curse. Israel's condition is hopeless. So when the Lord asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? What would you have said? Can these bones live? Ezekiel knows it would have to take a miracle of major proportions to bring the nation back to life, if one can even conceive of that. And so he throws the ball right back into the Lord's court. You know, beats me. Never seen anything like that, but hey, but these bones primarily represent the nation of Israel, God's chosen people called to be agents of his grace and blessing to the world who had miserably failed in that mission and they had miserably betrayed their Lord. So that's at the first level. That's what it's about. Second, though, these bones represent the condition of the entire human race. When you read the whole scriptures, you recognize that Israel is called by God and put in the land of Canaan by God to create a microcosm for the whole world to see of what grace can do with sinners. They're representative. God called Israel to be the embodiment of his trophies of grace for all the world to see. 
And at this moment, let me tell you, they represent us all. We are all members of that human race. Uh, According to Paul, the wages of sin is death for all. In another place he writes, you were dead in trespasses and sins which made us by nature children of God's fury. These bones are not only about Israel, they're a picture of our own lot in life as fallen humanity. So the question God asks of Ezekiel, he asks of us, can these bones live? Can the world be redeemed? Can we salvage this project? And Ezekiel's answer beats me, you know. Third, these bones represent the remains of the Western church. You see, Israel was the people of God, the called out ones, called to be saints, called to be pure, called to be agents of his grace, redeemed from bondage in Egypt. We too have been so called. We call ourselves the people of the Lord, the Lord's people. That's what they were doing. But we, too, have taken on all the characteristics of the world around us like the Israelites had. And when I look at the state of the church in this country, I smell the aroma of death. Some bones are very dry. It's most obvious in mainline churches, (laughs) which have few members to lose these days. They've shriveled and shrunk so badly. And they've long stopped pretending to take the scriptures as the base of their authority and life and truth and revelation. But what concerns me is the smell and the sight of death in the so-called evangelical church. We Aragon folks, I'm an evangelical. I'm born again. In many places, our churches have become comfortable pews where we go for affirmation in our self-indulgent living. Many many of us treat the scriptures like old country buffet where you can pick and choose what you want and typically we take what I like. I take what I like, probably the unhealthy stuff, And that which I really need, that I just ignore, I reject. Or these days, being born again is viewed as a ticket to health, happiness, and and success. But it has little transforming effect in how we live. This is a problem. This is a church that refuses to suffer, that has forgotten how to sacrifice. A church that doesn't challenge its people to take up the cross and follow Jesus. What does that mean? A church that doesn't challenge people to a higher morality that is common out there. A church that will rally its people to political agendas but never holds a conference on on feeding the hungry or helping unwed mothers or sheltering the homeless or breaking down walls of prejudice. This is a church that, like the Judah of Ezekiel's day, has created for itself an image of God with which it is very comfortable. My God is my God. He takes care of me and I am secure in him no matter what. My friends, the bones are getting awfully dry. Why is it that if you want to see the living church, you have to go to South America or um, uh, Romania or the back corners of China or the Ukraine? We had four pastors from the Ukraine in a college church the week before they invade the Putin's armies invaded. I tell you, I have rarely seen people who are so optimistic and with such a sparkle in their eyes as these folks. And I tell you, 
the light of God's grace was so evident in their lives. But where do they come from? A place now that you look on your Facebook pictures and say, you want to know what hell is like? This is it. And that's where they are. But as for our bones, I ask, can these bones live? Can our American evangelical church be resurrected? I get rather pessimistic. Sometimes I feel like packing up and moving to some place in the world where people are actually hungry for the gospel, where they're willing to give of themselves, where people combine right theology with right living. And yet I realize I'm part of the problem. I too am one of these living corpses. Sometimes I feel like the people in the, that the Lord quotes, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we're extinguished, extinguished. And sometimes in desperation, can it be a glimmer of faith in response to the question, can these bones live? I cry out, Lord, you know, I sure hope so. I pray that these bones can live. But how can that happen? What do dry bones need? Well, our text gives us a couple of clues. First, it will take a new infusion of the Spirit of God. I love the... This is a cartoon that Ezekiel sees playing out in front of him. Prophesy to the wind. Actually, that word wind here occurs uh, nine times in this whole passage in four different senses. It's the spirit of God. It is wind generally. It is the breath of God. And it is the four winds. That means four directions. This Ezekiel is the prophet of the spirit. And in this passage, we find fulfilled or expanded what we heard in chapter 36, 27, where the Lord had promised, I will put my spirit into my people and they will be restored to full and vital relationship with him. They will be my people and they will walk in my ways. What's the key? the life-giving, transforming power of the Spirit of God. You remember Genesis 2-7, God takes a little piece of dirt and he fashions it into a form of a human being, but it's dead until he breathes into it his breath and it comes to life as his image. As Ezekiel had told the Lord that he alone knows whether the bones can live, the Lord then tells him to prophesy over the bones and he will breathe into them his breath and they will come to life. And Ezekiel does so and guess what? He hears this rattling sound and all the bones are coming together joint on joint exactly as they're supposed to be in their place. And we have a whole field of Human bodies. Only one problem. They're not living human beings. Can these bones live? And then the Lord says to Ezekiel, come from, uh, tell, uh, tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath. Spirit, ruach, it's the same word. Prophesy to the breath. And Ezekiel calls for the breath and voila. Immediately, they all stand up, a vast, vast army. Well, what will it take to restore Israel to this status as the people of God? Nothing more nor less than a new moving of the Spirit of God. There's no way the present state of Israel is the fulfillment of this prophecy. In spite of what Orthodox Jews in Israel say and dream and what many Zionist Christians think, that's a secular state. 
and until the Lord breathes his breath into it, until he moves transformatively, the nation will remain in exile even while they're in his land. We pray that that will happen soon, that God's chosen people would be filled with the transforming, life-giving Spirit of God. What will it take to restore a human race under the curse? And of course, the answer is the same. A mighty movement of the Spirit. This is the only way. Je Jesus talked about this to Nicodemus, who was a rabbi, a professor at Wheaton College. He comes to Jesus at night, and before he even has a chance to blurt out his question, how can one be part of the kingdom of God, Jesus answers, you must be born again. But of course, he, he's a Pharisee, and he's a literalist. You mean that means I need to crawl back into my mummy's tummy? That's gross. And of course, Jesus said, don't, don't, don't you get it? Don't you get it? He gives them a lecture on the working of the Spirit, how it blows where it wants, but when it's there, you know it, you can feel it, because it results in life giving, uh, in life itself. Since the kingdom of God is spiritual, you cannot create this merely with physical means. And of course, this is the answer that the church needs as well. We need to pray. That the church itself, the nominal church, we've got all so many beautiful buildings all across this country, and you go to Europe, all kinds of museums there and memorials to peoples. These days we're talking about folly, the foolishness of the gospel. But there they are, empty. What will it take to bring back the life? What will it take? It will take nothing more nor less than the Spirit of God. But there's one other thing that needs to happen. And that is that the curse must be lifted. We are, the world is under the curse. We have ever since Genesis chapter 3. Since the end of the, 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 the Cold War uh, it ended, we thought we might have come out from under the curse. But of course, we still have all kinds of things that we fear. If it's not foreign armies and terrorists and whatever, or COVID, we fear the power of nature. There are mo so many signs of the world being under the curse, the World Health Organization, as of 4.37 p.m. Central Standard Time, April 28, 2022, there have been more than a half billion confirmed cases of COVID-19, half billion which included six, more than six million deaths around the world. Have you ever looked at the map and asked yourself, how many people are in, in the states of the United States of America? Do you know how many people have died of COVID? Enough to wipe out 34 of our states. We have 34 states that have fewer or that have uh, fewer population than have died from COVID in the last two years. Imagine. Well, until the Lord lifts the curse, until the Lord breathes life on this planet, we are all threatened. May the Lord work in us. Can these bones live? Prophecy conference uses, conferences used to be devoted to trying to figure out if and when the bones of Israel would come together in fulfillment of this prophecy. But my friends, we need to be asking, can these bones come together? 
Can we enjoy the life abundant that the Lord offers in this cursed world? Can our young people live? Can we who are engaged in ministry live as in Ezekiel's day? This question can only be answered by God. Lord, you know. You know. This text is a glorious testimony to the power of the of God to triumph over death. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we are dead in our transgressions has made us alive in Christ. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the one who saves us from our sin and lifts the curse, we have hope. In the face of Lazarus' death and Martha's grief in John 11, Jesus was intensely agitated. He was extremely angry and he wept. But in the miracle that followed, the climactic act of his life, the seventh sign in the book of John, Jesus would prove that he is indeed Yahweh incarnate, the source of life for a moribund world. Moments before Lazarus came, he called Lazarus from the tomb. He had tried to comfort Martha with those amazing words, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And in that amazing event, Jesus demonstrated that what the Lord had told Ezekiel of himself was true of Jesus. For he is Yahweh incarnate. He had said to Ezekiel, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life, verses 13 to 14. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. I have spoken and I will act the declaration of the Lord Yahweh. And that's what Jesus did with the resurrection of Lazarus. This was the declaration, I am Yahweh, the God of Israel, in your very midst, bringing life to a cursed world. As I have been Reflecting on all of this this week, a song has been ringing in my ears from William Patton Mackey in 1863. Revive us again, fill each heart with your love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. But how? And this is what the verses of that hymn expound. We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. All glory and praise to the lamb that was slain who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. All glory and praise to the God of all grace who has brought us and sought us and guided our ways. Revive us again. Fill each heart with your love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. My friends, as we go to the Lord's table, this, this is the hope we celebrate. Jesus said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you for your forgiveness. But what brilliant ray of light he cast on that event when he tells his disciples, I will not eat, drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What does that mean? What does that mean? We're all going to die, but guess what? We'll be back through the blessed work of Jesus, our Savior. So as we feast at his table, let's remember what he has done for us, lifting the curse, granting us salvation, and let's begin to pray for the winds of the spirit of the God who has given us new life, that they would blow across this land in the 
triumph of grace for the glory of God. Let's pray. We bless you, our Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life as we celebrate that resurrection and that life. Fill our hearts with humility for our sin. But fill our hearts with joy for the forgiveness you've brought. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Perhaps you find yourself in the valley today, the dry valley, surrounded by gloom and despair. Um, if so, there's good news that the breath of God is breathed out upon us. Let me give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, I had lunch with a friend in Wheaton, Jean-Luca Dardas. Some of you may recall that name. We prayed for him, his wife, several months ago. Uh, Gianluca is the lead pastor of Nova Vita Church in Bologna, Italy, where our missionaries, Marco and Fede, serve. I've known Gianluca for years, preached in his church. He was visiting the States. So there we were, in the middle of a restaurant in Wheaton, catching up. This was an emotional time, though, because less than a year ago, Gianluca lost his dear wife, Nella, uh, who died uh, after battling cancer. And so there we were, crying, sharing stories, talking with our hands, you know, making a spectacle of ourselves in the middle of it all. And you, you might wonder, how on earth can someone possibly rejoice in that situation? He has one daughter who's in her uh, early 20s, another who's a teenager. Well, this, this morning we've heard the answer. John Luca told the story about a tree that the city of Bologna dedicated in honor of Nella, and they planted it right there in the front of the church. She was such a servant, kind of like Lydia of old. She had a reputation among her neighbors as a lover of Christ, served others. So they planted this tree in her honor, and they put a plaque there, and gave thanks for her life. And John Luca took out his phone and showed me a picture. He said, look, it's less than a year, and there's already leaves on the tree, tears rolling down his face. I don't know where you are today, my friend, but the God who brings resurrection also brings renewal. He meets us here and now, provides us with precisely what we need. What's in that spirit? We approach the table. Would you please join me now as we pray? Almighty God, unto whom our hearts are open, our desires are known, 
and from whom no secrets are hid, would you meet us? Would you please cleanse our hearts by the inspiration of your Spirit so that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify you through Christ our Lord. Amen. This table represents the victory of Christ, our Savior who triumphed over sin and death, and it represents the communion that we possess with him by faith. If that is the conviction of your heart, then you're welcome to come. The table is not for the self-sufficient or the proud or those who refuse to bow the knee. If that describes you this morning, we ask you to please allow the elements to pass by, looking forward to the day when you can give full-throated confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Lord Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now let us pray for the cup. Oh Lord, each time we partake of the cup, We consecrate ourselves afresh to you, to give you our hearts, our thoughts, our everything. Because of Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior, we do that now by faith.
Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At this time, I invite you to please stand as we sing together our hymn of response. Dan for that word. I don't know about you, but I needed that message. Praise God for his enlivening presence through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you'd like to pray with an elder, uh, someone will be standing by here at the front at the platform. Uh, Please give us the privilege of praying with you. We hope you can fellowship for a bit after the service. We'll be gathering in our fellowship hall in the lower level. And I look very much look forward to returning to the pulpit next week. We are in this series during Eastertide, as you know, uh, considering the way in which the resurrection changes everything. Next week, we plan to look at David's encounter with Abigail and the way that brings peace 
in a world that's filled with conflict and turmoil. Well, at this time, let us receive the benediction. God's people, as we step into this world full of dead, dry bones, let us lift our eyes to the heavens and remember that our Redeemer lives. Amen. Please be seated.